Campus Fatsu and it's on, doesn't it? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Grace. Uh, well done with the names. Um, I'm just going to move that for a moment. Um, but just to know how. Um, apologies about the late start. Um, always when Rob goes away, there's technical issues. There's technical issues often when he's here, but it's always when Rob goes away, there's technical issues. I'm still going to stop him having some days off. <laughs> My stress levels uh, don't do well. Anyway, but it's funny, actually, because it's, it's a great little parable about um, actually what we're looking at with regards to um, uh, the text and what, what, the, what the text is saying to us. Um, and uh, we'll get into that. Uh, and see um, what the crack is, because we're picking up um, right from where we left off last week. Uh, so before we dive into this, uh, let's pray, because that's always a great start. So Father, thank you so much uh, that you are good, that you are kind, that you are generous. Thank you, Lord, that we get to open up your word, examine it, play with it, and discover uh, more about you and ourselves and community in the world. Help us, Lord, to interact um, this morning with what, you're, what you've got to say to us. Help us, Lord, to have open ears, open eyes, and an open heart to hear from you. Thank you that we get to trust you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, um, like I said, we're picking up from, the, from where we sat down last week, end of chapter 3, so we're starting at chapter uh, that's kind of what we're going to be doing as we go through Genesis. Um, and um, on the whole, I've, only, I've got a bit of homework for you um, this week um, because there's a big chunk and we're only going to be looking. We're, I can't get somebody to read four chapters. I feel that's a little bit unfair um, next week. So we're only going to be reading part of the story next week, but we'll be looking at the whole thing. Anyway, we'll get on to that. Um, We'll be doing the same as what we've done in previous weeks. We'll be trying to approach uh, this passage from an Eastern mindset, uh, admitting that we're thoroughly Western, though, in our outlook. Uh, but we're going to be trying to ask questions that um, uh, a Hebrew would ask about the text. Uh, and and recognising that the author and the audience of Genesis were, in fact, Hebrews. And so they uh, you know, connect with this slightly differently to how we do. Um, and uh, that there are tools and nuances uh, that are in the text that are there to help us discover more about uh, God and ourselves and the way that the world works uh, that we kind of miss out on because uh, we, 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 don't know, we don't know the tools. We're learning the tools. Um, so uh, that's what we're going to be doing. Um, and um, so let's start with a couple of observations shall we, uh, that we, sometimes we miss because of, um, well, because of the English, and we don't necessarily speak Hebrew, and we don't all use um, interlinear Bibles, and even that sometimes doesn't help, and um, I have a very fancy um, uh, tool on my computer called Accordance Bible Software, which really helps uh, stuff like that when you don't speak uh, Hebrew as, uh, as an alternative language. Um, anyway, um, so the first observation is this, is, is Cain's name. Uh, as we read it in the text, it gives us an understanding of what Cain means. It means, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. And what I have discovered and what I find fascinating is that it gives an insight into Adam and Eve's relationship. Um, it, this is because it can be read in one of two ways. Um, you can read it that Eve is, is actually quite angry with Adam. I don't know if you pick that up in the text. Um, and, uh, and that she's naming Cain despite of him, like excluding Adam from the whole picture. Like he's had nothing to do with this conception. Um, and... Um, you know, the focus then would be on the, the, the word I. And you'd, you'd kind of read it like this, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. A kind of, look what I've done. Look what the, me and the Lord have done together. You have nothing to do with it, you waste of space. 
Um, and, uh, and, you know, we've, we've got a broken relationship. We know we've got a bit of a broken relationship here between Adam and Eve. Um, I mean, um, <laughs> for goodness sakes, only the last chapter, you know, Adam has been the man that he's always wanted to be and blamed his wife entirely for the fact that he's eaten of the fruit of the tree of the good knowledge and kind of gone, well, that woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit. It's all her fault. If you'd have given me a different woman, then things would have turned out differently, obviously. Um, and, and you can imagine that Eve's like, oh, would you take some responsibility, man? Come on. This is why I love the phrase man up. I'm like, what, you, you know, what, like, like Adam? Like, you do take responsibility. Um, Rabbi Foreman, um, who's uh, uh, an Orthodox Jewish teacher that I uh, have discovered over the past couple of years, who's, who's brought all sorts of um, insights into um, the Torah that have really opened it up and helped me understand a bit more about how Jesus engaged with this stuff. Um, he points out that Cain's name actually can be translated as acquired. Uh, and in Hebrew, rather than, rather than the, the um, phrase brought forth, so I have acquired a, a man with the help of the Lord. Um, now, if, if you think about it, what does the word acquire mean? If you've, if you've acquired something. Um, now, I think there's one of two ways. You've either done it... Um, you know, it's, it's a polite way of saying you've stolen something, isn't it? Well, I acquired that. <laughs> it's, uh, or it's something that's been kind of handed down to you. You acquire knowledge when people teach you things. And, um, and even if you discover something for yourself, I still think that you use the tools that you've acquired over time to, uh, to discover stuff. Don't you? And this, uh, does, does that make sense? Kind of, yeah, yeah, good stuff. So, so Cain means acquired. And here's the thing about Hebrew names is that when Eve gives, C gives Cain um, his name, Eve understands that there is something significant. Your name was your essence. It was your destiny. Your name meant something. And your parents would likely have thought really, really hard about it and prayed about it before settling on something that they were going to give you because they understood the power of what we call something or someone. Remember, his dad, Adam, had been charged with naming all of the animals to give them identity. And I really resonate with this. I really do because, um, you know, we thought really hard about um, the name of our kids um, you know, having done you know a significant time in the, you know, the care sector and Annie being a teacher, quite often we'd go like when when we was when expecting the kids, we'd go, oh, what about such such name? We go, oh no, no, work with one of them. <laughs> 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 no way. <laughs> no, 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 for various reasons. And uh, because, you know, we know, don't we, that they give identity stuff. There's something significant about it. And there's a little part of me where um, uh, my daughter wants to be called Tilly rather than Talitha. She, she actually says, I can't stand my name, Dad. And I'm like, oh, we agonized over that. We, it speaks so much about who you are, your identity, your, what we saw in you when you were just a thought. Well, growing anyway. You see, names are important. They shape. Now, it appears that Eve names Cain out of her experience, but his name is going to shape him for better or worse. And, and, and his name, like I say, his name it means acquired. Um, it, it feeds into this story, and as this story moves on, it tells us something about his offering. Um, and so we jump into this, this scenario, this, this interesting um, piece of, scripture where we've got this comparison going on between offerings uh, one that God likes Abel's and one that God doesn't like Cain's and the strange thing is is that we're not told in this paragraph why God um, likes Abel's offering but doesn't like Cain's and there is this strange discussion that 
sometimes goes on about this passage that I, I think I've even taught myself over the times, um, where people point out that, or, or were trying to point out that Abel's offering was taken the best portion, because it talks about the fat portion, that would have been the best portion, and Cain's wasn't, and that was the problem. But actually, it doesn't tell us that. It tells us it does tell us that Abel's offering was out of the fat portion, but it doesn't tell us that Cain's wasn't out of the best of his crops. It doesn't say that. It just says God doesn't like it. So we're, we're immediately back to one of these problems with the text. And the problem that we have is it kind of... It, pulls something out about the nature and character of God that maybe should challenge us a little bit and draw us in and go make us go, what on earth is going on here? So we know that God is a good father, right? Yeah? Oh, no, that's good, that's good. We know that Yahweh, uh, Yahweh has been setting himself up as different from all the other gods that were being worshipped around him at the time. That's the story, and that's what continues throughout um, these first few chapters of Genesis. He, you know, they take um, one, one of the objections to Christian faith is that there are all these other similar stories in the ancient Near East. Um, and, and actually what, what's going on here is that God is saying, no, I'm not like Gilgamesh, who was one of the gods i'm not like baal i'm not like so on and so forth i'm this is my nature and this is my character so when god highlights part of his nature and his character for us we need to go oh what's going on here why is he drawing attention to us um and um you know and, and the fact that we know we've got a good father it, you know we can we can jump forward thousands of years to teaching teaching us of jesus about prayer, where Jesus tells his disciples that if, even if an <coughs> earthly father who is evil knows how to give good gifts, how much more does your heavenly father who is perfect know how to give good gifts? So, so Jesus, knowing all this stuff, being all that, being taught, being immersed, being God himself as well, um, you know, like go like this is so important for us to grasp. But like I say, we have a bit of a problem because the image that God puts himself in, in this passage, um, is, is a bit of a juxtaposition. See, does God ask for sacrifices? No. No, he doesn't, does he? See, these, these, these people, um, they bring their sacrifices from a heart of worship. They want to bring something to the Lord who they love. They've come up with this idea by themselves. So again, using my children as an example, imagine when they were younger, I get home from work, and both of them have been making pictures for me. If this happened quite a bit, you know, they would make stuff and they'd want to show me things when I got in. Um, and um, now imagine that they both run excitedly to the door. That never happened. No, it did. Uh, <laughs> but imagine that they, they both ran excitedly with their offerings for me as I walked through the door. And, uh, and, and they go like, Daddy, 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 look what I've made you. Look what I've made you. And I pick one and I take one and look at it and go, oh, this is amazing. This is brilliant. This is like I'm going to phone the, the National Gallery and get this put on display for everybody. It's amazing. The best you know, move over Picasso, move over Van Gogh, move over all you Renaissance artists. Genius child. And then pick up the next one and go, hmm, rubbish. You'd think, what on earth is going on now, wouldn't you? You know, especially if I screwed up and threw it out. What kind of dad would I be? Now imagine that the one that I loved was from the younger kid. It was from Talitha instead, and it was just like face blue and it you know, and, and, and really wasn't better than the older child's from Kulos. What kind of dad would that make me be? See, no, a good dad 
would love both of those gifts because they're uninvited, aren't they? They're unasked for. And you'd put both of them on the fridge or on the stairs as we did in uh, one of our houses. We had pictures of, from our kids of different ages going up the stairs. Uh, and you'd give them loads of praise, both of them, wouldn't you? And loads of encouragement. Wow, this is brilliant. This is amazing. But that's not what we find in this text, is it? In the reading, we have God going, Abel, I love it. Cain. Ugh. Yuck, try better next time. So it raises the question that this story has to be about something else. Because, actually, you know, that it goes that back. This position, this juxtaposition that we have, it goes against what we know of the nature and character of God and what he revealed so far to us. So we need to dig in and we need to see what God may be trying to teach his people. I think that the answer comes in the interaction between God and Cain. Um, and the Lord, you know, the Lord says to him, he says, why are you angry? Why is your face so downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if, you do, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So Cain is in this crucial moment. And I wonder if his name gives us some insights into what's going on here. Let's remember what his name means. Cain means acquired. And it could be a good thing if we see it like his mom saw it. That Cain would always remember where his gifts come from, that they come from God. That she's acquired him from God, that he is a gift to her. Like the fruit that he is gathering, like the crops that are growing, he didn't make it grow. The Lord did, he's just acquiring from them. But What's going on if we, if this is spun in a bad way? What happens if fear enters the equation? If we only acquire our things from God from a fear basis? Well, it makes us worry that there's not enough. That there's, a not, there's not enough from God. Now, let's say you have a sibling who is bringing impressive gifts to your dad, but you, but you know that you can only bring gifts that dad helped you get. So think about this. Cain is a farmer and he is totally dependent on the weather, totally dependent on the sun, totally dependent on the soil conditions. He has no control over any of these things. He knows that he is totally dependent on God to provide for him and for him to acquire anything. Now he could sit back and if he trusts the story like we know humanity has been invited into doing, he could sit back and revel in the way that God works, which in turn allows him to acquire all he needs and more to give this sacrifice. And more. But if fear comes into the equation and he has a brother who is really winning the admiration of his dad because he's able to go out and hunt and catch things, he's going to see his brother as competition and fear is going to break the trust that he has with his dad. He's going to break the trust that he has with God and he is going and fear he is, he is going to fear that he won't have enough and be able to give enough. Fear is going to trip up Cain and make him stumble away from trusting the story of God. So instead of reveling in God's provision, all that he is able to acquire from God, um, and, and sorry, and, and all that he is able to acquire from God, fear is going to tell him that there isn't enough and he will never be enough. So Cain is at a crossroads because his whole identity is made up of what he can acquire. And he finds himself in a place where instead of trusting the story of God, and instead of trusting God for his provision, he 
he now feels threatened. But if he, but he, but if he isn't good enough, if he can't produce enough, if he can't do something, then he's not going to get the admiration of God, and he's failed. I wonder how many of us identify with that. But God doesn't see it like this. Which is why he asked Cain, why are you so angry and downcast? Everything about this story hinges on this question. We have stuff that goes on afterwards, which is amazing, and we'll come back to it at another time, um, about the cities and his, Cain's wives and all that sort of stuff and what it means and stuff. But it all, all of that stuff hinges on that, on this questions. And one of the things that interests me and what caught my heart and my imagination when I first heard this is that the typical Christian teacher will say, I'll tell you why Cain is angry and upset. It, he's angry and upset because his mom sinned. Humanity is broken and hopeless, and so he's angry and upset because he hasn't pleased God, and there's loads of reasons why he's angry and upset, but ultimately it's sin's fault. His heart has changed. He see, you know, God sees him differently. There's this rift, there's this break. But actually, I, I, what I love about the story is that if you look at it, if we read it, God's position to mankind, to humanity, hasn't changed at all. It's our understanding of ourselves that's changed. And if you remember last week, we talked a lot about humanity and their shame and how God meets them where they are at and, and gives them clothes. And you see, God's position hasn't changed. When sin enters the world, God's position, God still cares. He doesn't cut them off. Like every other story about the divine in the near the ancient near east would tell you god's attitude would change and it would be all about destruction and death and just getting rid of it and, and so you'd have this humanity fighting against the god no not this time not with this god but we so often being told that god kicks the humans out of the garden and separates himself from them but that's not what happens. God is still interacting, still caring. He hasn't changed at all. God's position with Cain hasn't changed. In fact, his question is really telling Cain that he can do the right thing. He can trust the story. He's saying, don't let your anger, don't let your downcastness Get in the way of who you are designed to be. Apparently God believes that Cain can be the person who he was made to be. Otherwise, this question from God makes no sense whatsoever. If you remember the other week, week one of this uh, new series, it's going to take a few years, um, I suggested that the Eastern and Western view of sin were at odds with one another. And that the Western view is all about thoughts, all about our minds and the way that we think. Whereas the Eastern view is all about what we do. And this is where one of the places that it comes into real contrast. Where God says, don't be angry, don't be upset, just do the right thing. Be real about what you're thinking and feeling, but do the right thing. He's saying, my position, he's saying, Cain, my position with you hasn't changed at all. I'm not angry with you. I don't despise you. I don't hate you. I don't like Abel more than you. I just like his sacrifice, where his heart's coming from. Here's all you need to do, Cain. Give me a good sacrifice tomorrow. You're still loved. You don't need to be angry. You don't need to be sad. Just do the right thing. Trust me. It's the same idea as last week. Listen to what God says to him. Cain, sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is to consume you, but you must master it. The Lord is telling him, you, Cain, are not a beast. 
You have a desire, you have a fear, you have an insecurity that needs to be met, but you can choose not to act on it. You can master it, you can say enough. Cain can decide for himself that he is not a beast. He can say, I can let my anger and downcast attitude die right here. And I can trust the story. And I can trust that God loves me as much now as before. I don't need to compare myself to my brother. I'm fine. I'm going to stay right here and I'm going to trust God. That's the invitation that we see repeatedly. That's the invitation that we all have. That's the amazing thing. That's the invitation that we get to extend to everybody as well. That God is just, he's just opening up to us and saying like, you can trust me. You don't need to fight. You don't need to compare. You don't need to run hard against other people. You don't need to fear that there's not enough in the world. You don't need to hang on to things tightly. We can give him our desires. We can give him our insecurities. And we're going to see this story, like so many stories, is going to end in tragedy. In fact, we saw it. We had it in the reading. Because Cain doesn't do the right thing. And we see this pattern play out time and time and time and time again. And it always, instead of stopping, it always ends in tragedy. And this, these characters are going to give in to their desires. Let fear get the best of them. And it does, it ends horribly. It ends with murder. See, this is an amazing story that helps anchor us in how God deals with us. And when, uh, when, when we make mistakes... When we sin, we're not saying that this story or Genesis 1, 2, 3 isn't pointing out that we are sinful. Because it does, you know, of course it does. And we know that we all mess up. We all know that we sin. We all know that there are times that we need to say sorry and bring, you know, our, our stuff to God. What this story tells us is that God act, reacts completely differently to how we think he does or should or could. God comes to us and says, why are you angry? Why are you downcast? Why are you fearful? Why are you comparing yourself? Why are you full of shame? Why all this stuff? Just do the right thing. It's because you are valuable. You are loved. You are immeasurably more brilliant than what you've ever thought or dreamed of. Just trust me. All you need to do is let this season pass and do the right thing next. It's so freeing. And it means that when we mess up, there's not this whole thing that we need to go through to get rid of sin of like this whole like transform. Just choose to do the right thing. It's so simple and so beautiful and so freeing. And it means that actually the next time we stumble, instead of going like, oh, I cry, you know, and like, it's, you know, there is, we come back and we, and know that we can just make the right choice the next time. So I want to give you a book re recommendation uh, that maybe some of you, want to dig out and have a look at you can get it on kindle for about seven pound fifty or stuff like that and it's one of um, rabbi david foreman's books um and it's one of the one of the books that has really shaped my thinking over the last couple of years and it's called the beast that crouches at the door and it looks at this whole story if you want it so if you've been sort of intrigued about where i'm getting some of this stuff from over the last few weeks this is one of the books that's really um uh, helped me think through um, how all this interacts into it. Now, like I said before, and I said last week, Rabbi Foreman is a, he's a rabbi. That should give you a bit of a clue. He's an Orthodox Jew. He doesn't talk about Jesus. Um, so you kind of have to 
do that work for yourself. But his understanding on God and Torah is so amazing and it's really worth getting a hold of. Because actually the grace that's on offer here is what Jesus builds upon in his teachings and his way that he reveals scripture to us. That's why Jesus said, you know, I came to fulfill the law, not to get rid of it. This is what he's talking about. This is who he is. He says that that reuniting and that that non-competition is why when we see um, in the reinstatement of Peter at the uh, at the beach where you know Peter starts to almost straight away slip back into this where he kind of looks back over his shoulder and sees John you know the disciple that Jesus loves I love John's attitude um, I, I was the quickest and I'm the one that he really loves that's, that's John um, but Peter says you know well what about him and Jesus is like no 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 don't compare yourself with him it doesn't matter if I want him to live until I come back that's my business, not yours. It's exactly this. We have our part to play in the community together. And we get to choose to trust the story. So that's where I'm going to leave it for this week. There's loads more I could unpack. Um, um, next week we're going to jump into, uh, into Noah uh, so like I said I've got a little bit of homework for you Noah covers four chapters chapters 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9 maybe that's 5 chapters that's 5 chapters isn't it because 5 plus 4 equals 9 but if you want to read all of 9 it actually goes to 10 doesn't it so it's 5 chapters simple maths Gavin um yeah, so have a read of that. So that's there you are, five, five chapters, one chapter a day, Monday to Friday. A little task for you, a little bit of homework. Um, and, um, and then we're going to be unpacking Noah uh, next week and uh, looking at about what he might be saying to us. Um, does that make sense? Is that good? Cool. Are you still keeping you engaged with, with this? Not too confusing? I shouldn't ask that from the front, should I really? <laughs> what if you say yes? Um, <laughs> well, let's pray, and then I'm going to invite Annie to come as we, uh, we worship again. So, Father, thank you so much uh, that we get to trust your story, that our identities um, aren't built upon what we can do on our desires, on our longings, but they're built on you and how we, you see us. Thank you, Lord, that how you see us never changes. Thank you that your love for us, your heart towards us never changes. Thank you that it's always, always an invitation to trust you more, to walk with you more. Thank you, Lord, that your grace and mercy are simple things. And whatever's happened in the past, thank you, Lord, that we can choose right now to trust you afresh. And so help us, Lord, to make that cho choice.